Hey, what is up everyone? Welcome back to Life on the Wrist. Hope you all are doing well. Auction season in New York is about to kick off. It's pretty exciting when you could see what the big auction houses have curated. It's been really fun. I, I actually had a chance to check out the previews um, at the auction houses this past weekend. Um, and there's some really cool pieces that have, that have come up. Some significant pieces in, in each of the auctions. So I'll go over Phillips, Sotheby's, and Christie's. Um, there are some other, I think some other auctions that are going on. I want to say Antiquorum has one in Hong Kong actually coming up. Um, so, um, some, some pretty cool pieces that I'll, that I'll talk through. Just off the back of Hong Kong, I think, um, I think a lot of people are sort of saying that, uh, we kind of saw some normalization of the prices of watches, um, at, at auction in Hong Kong. Um, Coming off of Geneva, I think uh, Geneva, we saw some pretty pretty good results for, for some of the pieces that were selling, um, uh, that that were you know uh, up in the up in the records for, for some of the watches, um, but I think Hong Kong was a sort of a normalization, or it showed some some fairly normal prices. Um, that could be because I think Hong Kong had a, a higher quantity of watches that were uh, modern and not vintage so you know modern prices i think have sort of sort of come down from the highs that they were seeing previously so uh, i'll dive right in i think i'll start with uh, phillips um one of the most um i'd say probably one of the most important watches that are that are um one of the most important watches that's being sold uh this this season in new york is uh lot 12 um, it's, not, it's not a watch, it's a pocket watch. It's a Roger Smith, which is it's his number two pocket watch that was manufactured in 1998. So I think everyone knows the story of Roger Smith, but I'll briefly um, kind of talk about it. He, um, he worked closely with um, George Daniels, and um, before Roger Smith ever made a watch, he, he, you know, George Daniels told him, you know, go ahead and try and make a pocket watch. And he came, and I think he spent something like 18 months or something like that. Uh, making the, the the first pocket watch and he brought it to George Daniels presented it to him and there was a lot wrong with it and I think George Daniels um, wasn't very impressed so Roger Smith went back to the drawing board and, and started working on his second pocket watch and I think he spent something like six years um, producing this watch really focusing on the finer details of, of what needs to be done to make a an exceptional piece and um, that pocket watch he then presented to George Daniels after the, the years that he spent um, making it. And um, George Daniels sort of examined it and then said, congrats, you're now a watchmaker. And that specific watch is being sold at Philips. So it's a yellow gold perpetual calendar tourbillon pocket watch with moon phase, leap year indicator, and spring teton escapement. Um, handmade, everything made by Roger Smith. This watch really is... Um, it has a presence. Uh, I know that sounds really strange to speak about a watch that way, but um, when I saw it in person, it really um, it speaks to <laughs> the importance of George Daniels, the importance of Roger Smith, but also the importance of all the things that watchmakers really desire to to accomplish when they make a piece. Um, and Roger Smith, I think, is easily one of the most um, influential. Uh, watchmakers of of our time um i you know george daniels also and i think that <laughs> this watch really is a testament to to them so lot 12 if you're interested it's it's going to be interesting to see what it goes for i, I really do think it's going to go for some some really good prices lot 57 at phillips is a <clears throat> fresh of the market 3448 in yellow gold with a perpetual calendar moon phase this watch uh, the reason why i love it so much is um the yellow gold has oxidized and if you know i f i absolutely love oxidation on, on watches so this patalone is um in in pretty good nick um i don't i can't really tell if it's been polished or not um on the front of it it, it looks it looks decent but um and if you kind of flip it over i think the lugs are super super sharp and i think the oxidation it, as well as I think the lugs on the back really show that this might not have been polished, but the oxidation makes it look incredible. And um, 
yeah, one of one of probably one of my favorite lots this this season is is this, but just because of the hue of the the uh, yellow gold that's uh, been nicely oxidized. One of the other things that I that I really loved was a um, uh, a watch, a uh, lot eighty seven. It's a pink gold minute repeater petrol calendar pocket watch with moon phase. Um, and, um, this watch I, I saw in person and, um, the reason why I thought it was so interesting was, um, it's from 1895 and it was, um, pr- uh, produced in 1895, sold in 1899, comes with a 14 karat gold pocket knife that's engraved Alfred G. Stein, um, and has a, a the, the watch... Um, comes with this commemorative me- medal. Um, the reason why I really love this is um, the the provenance. Um, Alfred G. Stein was an early partner of Patek Philippe, um, and uh, he worked. Um, he 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 trained as a watchmaker, and then he worked for Tiffany and Co. before joining Patek Philippe in eighteen ninety six, um, and. I think this watch is, um, yeah, I, I, th- th- there's, there's, there's so much, um, I'd say passion and history for the brand that, that comes uh, in this watch. Um, what's really cool is when you open up the case back, you see the finishing on this watch with, um, just perfect, perfectly manufactured, perfect, um, condition. It looks like it's, it looks really, really great. Um, he he actually um, uh, Stein actually became the head of a newly formed company in New, in New York, and was in charge of Patek Philippe's um, distribution in America, uh, and he held that for three decades through Patek Philippe's acquisition um, by the Stern family, and then passed away in nineteen thirty four. But um, I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, Talk about a person of historical significance for the brand and an incredibly fine watch. Lot 89 is a really nice 2481 from Patek Philippe. It has this really beautiful cloisonné enamel pristine forest dial. I think cloisonné enamel dials are um, getting a lot of uh, maybe more coverage. I think they're, they've always been um, fairly desired by collectors. Um, and, uh, and, um, you know, people have always sort of chased them, um, but, uh, I think there's a little bit more coverage of them on social medias or on, um, you know, YouTube or whatever, um, which is exciting because I think it's an interesting angle to, to collect. Um, the watch is preserved in really great condition, um, doesn't look like there's been any restoration to the dial. Um, it's believed through research that um, this is one of 10 examples that, that have this dial type, which is <laughs> uh, shows rarity, um, for sure. I think handling this in person really gives you the significance of this, um, of, of how difficult it is to, to make something so beautiful in um, enamel. Um, so there's a, there's a 3800, which is lot 111 uh, in stainless steel, it's a mid-size, so 37 and a half millimeters from 1987. Um, I thought I'd just call this out because I do think that this will probably get some some nice attention. Phillips also has um, another watch that I fell in love with at the at the exhibit, which was lot 124, which is a reference for uh, 1436. Um, first time on the market, split second chronograph. Um, this watch uh, was from 1950. And the 1436 was made in fairly low quantities. Um, it's believed that about 140 examples were produced in the 33 years that it was on the market. Um, it's believed that this is one of only 10 examples, um, with ha- which has a coaxial pusher and index, um, index hour markers on the dial in yellow gold. So if you don't know, um, if you don't know the, this, um, this reference, the 1436, had um, a first generation, which was um, the cases were uh, produced by Emile Vichette. Um, and then the later generations um, were produced by 
Ponti Genari Ancia. Um, the second generations uh, featured a coaxial button within the crown to split and reunite the split second chronograph hands, which makes it technically a little bit more, or technically um, an interesting, an interesting um, sort of uh, an interesting version or generation of this of this specific piece. Fresh to market, thirty millimeters. I mean, it fits me just perfectly. <laughs> I also got the chance to take a look at lot 129, which is a reference 4072. It's a steel vachel cosita with um, gold hour hands and gold um, uh, crown that's, you know, obviously certified by the, or it's um, proven that this is how it came with the certificate certificate of, authentic, certificate of authenticity. This is a really cool vachel Vintage Vachon um, chronograph. You don't really see too many of these pop up, but I, I like that there's, there's one. It has a pulsation dial, which is also really cool. Unfortunately, there's a little bit of a little bit of um, uh, of I don't know if you even know if it's damage or if it's just like coloration near the signature. Um, otherwise, this watch should be um, a, a real winner. Moving on to Sotheby's. Sotheby's has their important watches auction um there's a really beautiful reference 2451 calatrava from 1955 with brigade numbers if you don't know this watch is a very similar case to the reference 96 but it came with a screw down case back which made it water resistant which is pretty cool um it's in really great condition um uh, for the I, I got a chance to actually take a look at this in a loop and um things look pretty good the only thing that looks a little bit different is um, the 60, uh, if you look at the sub-seconds, um, there's a little bit of, um, I think it might just be the crystal that's sort of, uh, got some scratches on it that might make it look a little bit, uh, different. There's also a black dial reference 2526, um, first series black dial from 1957, um, the 2526 is super desirable, um, if you don't know. Um, it's one of the most appreciated, being that it's really rare. Um, and uh, and um, yeah, super, super desirable. I mean, for, for a Calatrava, 2526 estimate go for between 1,500,000 USD. So I think that's a pretty accurate estimate. There's a really cool Breguet 3135, lot 52. Um, that's, I think, shows the skills of Breguet, and honestly, I think has sort of a romantic feel to the things that they produced in the 90s, so 1995, pretty pretty nice uh, piece there as well. There's a really cool pocket watch, reference um, 3565 6BC, uh, lot 53, which is a white gold and diamond set skeletonized open-faced uh, pocket watch. I think the open-faced idea of this watch is really cool, and I think diamonds are sort of becoming somewhat popular um, on, on pieces. Um, talk about craftsmanship, talk about beauty. Um, to make a, such a transparent and thin piece is um, pretty, pretty amazing, um, to, to say the least. There's also a reference 5256 BA from Audemars Piguet, which has a yellow gold and enamel square uh, shaped uh, watch from 1966. It's got a really cool, um, really cool sort of green enamel around the outside of the, the case um, that I think is um, fairly interesting. Um, I think the reason why I sort of added this to the list of things that I wanted to talk about was the idea that um, uh, I think smaller watches have become kind of popular. You see them in pop culture, you see people wearing these pieces that might be a little bit small on the wrist, but uh, really, really elegant. Uh, Piaget, you know, think about Piaget with, like, stone dials and stuff like that. Um, I think this is a really <laughs> great example of it. Um, the uh, the watch actually um, had a... Uh, comes with... Um, uh, with a... Uh, service papers um, of it being serviced in uh, 2019, which is kind of interesting. Um, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a thing that you might not see every every day. I think one of the most, ex you know, 
significant loss is 104 at Sotheby's, which is an Omega Speed Master reference 145022-69, which is a yellow gold chronograph that was presented to Apollo 13 Command Module Pilot John Jack uh, uh, Schweiger Jr. and made in um, 1970. Obviously, you, you probably know the relationship of NASA and... and um, and the Speedmaster, um, but, uh, you know, this is fairly significant, I don't want to sort of go through too much information, but, um, because I, I encourage you to take a look at the video that they made specifically for this launch, which really talks about, you know, Apollo 13 and, and the significance of that launch, so check out the, the link in the show notes, but the engraving's great, um, it also comes with a lot of commemorative pieces, or commemorative, you know, sort of memorabilia from, uh, Schweiger, um, like a mail envelope, patches, coins, matchbox, pin. Um, so uh, this is one of the premium lots, and I'm sure it's going to go for quite a bit. Christie's has their important watches auction. Um, lot one is really great. It's a Hoyer Abercrombie & Fitch uh, reference 2447 Seafair. Um, it's a steel uh, watch with a tide indicator and regatta counter. If you like oceans, um, this is a pretty cool one. I actually think it's a nice way to start the auction with something that's fairly accessible to um, a wide range of collectors and, and to chronograph enthusiasts. There's also a really cool Tudor Reference 79030N Black Bay 58 with a pirate flag. Um, these were made in very limited uh, quantities. This is number 27 of 82. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the Black Bay 58 was launched in 2018 and has really become extremely popular. Um, it's, this is the first known example of a pirate edition of the 58. Um, it's, uh, the present lot is, it's, it's very, um, sort of, um, it was a, um, collection of, um, watch collectors who worked at Apple um, and, 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 and Tudor and they became the, um, came up with this timepiece that features in the Apple pirate emoji flag to pay homage to, uh, to pay homage to um, Steve Jobs who said that it's more fun to be a pirate than to join the Navy. Um, if you look at the uh, case back, you actually see the pirate and then it's a limited edition um, being 27 of 50 of uh, 27 of 82 <clears throat> um there's a really cool reference 5513 with a tropical dial um which is lot 14 which i thought was quite nice um the subs you know obviously a, an absolute classic um classic piece uh, it's a fresh to the market and original owner um lot which is really great was a gift to the owner from his mother in 1967. Um, and they have the original receipts from B. Harris and Sons Jeweler in New York. Uh, the, the individual ended up entering military training to become a lieutenant in the U.S. Army sig uh, Signal Corps and um, fought in South Vietnam uh, and wore the peace while he was, um, while he was fighting. This watch is probably as original as you can probably get it. The crystal is uh, somewhat scratched, um, which makes it pretty pretty darn original. As far as the case goes, um, obviously you're gonna have scratches on the piece. I'm not really sure about polishing on the case. I, I had what well, didn't I wasn't able to see this in person, but if you want to know about patina on a dial, um, this is uh, one that you have to absolutely check out. Um, all original subs are obviously really popular, and it's going to be interesting to see what this goes for. The last lot I want to talk about is lot uh, 66, which is a Patek Philippe reference 3215, which is a platinum and diamond set bracelet watch with hinge cover. Um, this is the only known example of this piece. Um, ladies' watches have become pretty popular, I think, this last year. We've seen you know people go to smaller pieces and... Um, this is really the most elegant watch you can probably think of. Um, big shout out to Charlie Dunn and Eric Wind of Wind Vintage who researched this lot pretty heavily. Um, if you don't listen to the collectability 
uh, not a collectability, that's John Ridden. If you don't listen to to their podcast, um, I highly encourage you to check it out because they cover some really great um, things over there. And um, one of the things that I really love about Significant Watch, the Significant Watches podcast, I should just mention that. Significant Watches podcast is the, is the name of it, but um, one of the things I love about them is it's raw. They have their opinions and, and they, they say it how it is. It's also not like your typical podcast. Um, so definitely check them out. But um, this watch is um, pretty crazy. So it's, uh, you have 80 Marques cut diamonds, uh, 194 baguette cut diamonds, and 58 brilliant cut diamonds, uh, all in this, in this bracelet watch as this cover. Um, I'll sort of read it. it you know they they it's obviously extraordinarily rare to find this timepiece today it's a it company it's accompanied by a Patek Philippe extract from the archives confirming the year's manufacture in 1957 the model was featured on the cover of Louis Cotier's Montre et Bijoux 1957 catalog along with a matching jewelry piece from Patek Philippe as seen in the image uh, attached to this lot um, this was uh, locked away in an owner's safe and is really one of the uh, grails. This is this is one of one, like one of the only ones known um, to to come to market. So, um, pretty significant. It's estimated to go for forty to sixty thousand US dollars. I really don't think that's that's um, that's uh, that's accurate. <laughs> um, we'll see what what happens uh, at auction, but um, you know, only known example. So, never know. Anyway, um, I'll leave links in the show notes for you to check out each of these auctions. I encourage you to take a look at these pictures while we sort of talk through them. Let me know what your favorite lot is. Um, I'm excited for this weekend and to see what uh, what the results are going to be like. Um, I'm sure that there's going to be some, maybe some records, maybe it'll continue the trend of um, Hong Kong. I really, I think because we have more vintage pieces here, I think that might be, um, might sway in a different direction, but we'll have to have to take a look. Um, if you are new to the Life Learners podcast, be sure to subscribe, follow us, uh, and if you are feeling generous and wouldn't mind leaving a rating, that would really help me out. Make sure to check out lifeunders.com and our social media accounts. With this said, guys, thank you so much for this podcast, and until next time.